So today we're going to talk about colligative properties. These are properties of solutions that depend on the total concentration of solute particles. Okay. They don't depend on what the solutes are. What matters is what's the total concentration of the solute particles in the solvent, uh, in the solution. And it depends on the nature of the solvent, not the solute. Okay. So a colligative property would be equal to some constant. That particular constant depends on what your solvent is. Okay, times the concentration of all the solute particles. So as far as counting the particles are concerned, an ion counts as one particle. Okay, a molecule counts as one particle. So um, these are the colligative properties that we're going to be looking at. There's four of them. Vapor pressure lowering, okay, freezing point depression, boiling point elevation, and osmotic pressure. So here, the constants that depend on the nature of the solvent would be, in the case of vapor pressure lowering, we represent that by P star solvent. In the case of um, freezing point depression, that constant is called K sub F. In the case of boiling point elevation, that constant is K sub B. In the case of osmotic pressure, that constant is RT. Okay? Um, now, in the case of osmotic pressure, RT doesn't depend on the solvent itself. It's uh, R is just a universal constant and T is a temperature. Okay. So let's talk about vapor pressure first so we can understand what vapor pressure lowering is. Okay, so vapor pressure refers to the partial pressure of a gas in equilibrium with a liquid. Okay. Or so if, if imagine you have let's say a beaker that has water in it. What will happen if you just leave that beaker lying on your bench top? and it eventually dries out, right? So your liquid leaves. So the, the way you interpret that is your molecules are able to leave your liquid and eventually they all go. But what happens, okay, if instead you put a lid on that, so you cover that beaker, so it's, uh, it's airtight, okay? So no molecules can leave, no molecules can come in, what will happen? It's not going to dry out, right? Now, uh, but eventually what happens is if you monitor the pressure of this, okay, uh, let me make a better sketch here. So I have a sealed container, or I have a liquid. Eventually the rate at which your, your molecules leave the liquid will be equal to the rate at which the molecules go back to the liquid. So eventually, the gas in here is going to have a constant pressure, as long as the temperature remains constant, okay? So at a given temperature, we say that the pressure of the ga gas that will be in equilibrium with the liquid, we say they're at equilibrium. Equilibrium means the rate of vaporization will be equal to the rate of condensation. The pressure of the gas that you have there is called the vapor pressure of your liquid, okay? So that vapor pressure is constant at a given temperature. If you raise the temperature, you'll, you'll have the, li the molecules will have a greater tendency to escape the liquid, so the vapor pressure will increase. That makes sense, right? You give them more energy, they're better able to go into the gas phase. So that increases with temperature. And when that vapor pressure reaches one atmosphere, then we say we are at the normal boiling point of the liquid. Okay, so when water, in other words, when you have water, okay, you increase the temperature of the water. By the time you get to uh, 100 degrees Celsius, your water starts to boil, right? And that's the point where the vapor pressure of the water is going to reach one atmosphere, okay? So that's called your normal boiling. So let's see if you understood that concept. Uh, let me see if I can... I forgot to turn on the clicker again. Let me just turn on the clicker first. On the
So here's a clicker question. Consider two enclosed, identical enclosed containers. Closed containers are shown here on the right with different amounts of water. So this is what liquid water right here. Okay. And so that will be in equilibrium with water vapor, right? At equilibrium, at the same temperature, so both containers at the same temperature, in which container will be the partial pressure of water be higher? Is it container A, container B, or will it be the same? <coughs> Sorry, it's <laughs> like falling. So stop the poll. Let's see how we did. All right. Um, let's go back to that slide, previous slide, okay? The vapor pressure is constant at a given temperature for a given liquid. Two liquids are both water. They're at the same temperature. You want to try it again? Let's see how we're doing this time better okay so for as long as you have gas and liquid at equilibrium okay same temperature the vapor pressure will be the same so how can the vapor pressure be the same here if we have different volumes that simply means you get more molecules go back to this one correct answer for this was C, right? Okay. That simply means that in container A, you have more molecules of water in the vapor than in container B, okay? If you remember from your ideal gas law, PV equals NRT, right? P equals NRT over V, okay? So if you're going to have the same pressure, okay, then that means you're going to have the same concentration since a bigger volume simply means you're going to have more moles there of water vapor. All right. Let's do this one. Consider the two identical containers again at the same temperature. I just gave you the answer to this one. Okay. At equilibrium, same temperature, which container has more water molecules in the gas phase? A, B, or neither? What did we say the vapor pressure was in both of these cases? The same, right? So PV equals NRT. So if we want to compare N, N equals PV over RT. Okay, the pressure is the same in both containers. They're at the same temperature. You're dealing with the same liquid. R and T are the same. R is a constant. Temperature of both containers is the same. Which container has more volume? more volume of gas, a bigger gas volume. So you have more gas in A, the, the volume of the gas in A, that means you have more moles of the water vapor in container A. And that's how it's able to have the same partial pressure as container B. You just have uh, more molecules in container A. So the correct answer here would be A, okay? The vapor pressure of water at room temperature is A, less than one atmosphere, B, equal to one atmosphere, or C, higher than one atmosphere. Right. Okay. Let's see how we did. 
What did we say happens to vapor pressure as you raise the temperature? It increases, right? And once the vapor pressure reaches one atmosphere, then that's when it starts to boil, right? So at what temperature does the vapor pressure of water reach one atmosphere? When does water, at what temperature does water boil? 100 degrees Celsius. So at room temperature, the vapor pressure of water must be less than one atmosphere. It's not boiling at room temperature, right? So uh, the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. That's when it, its vapor pressure reaches one atmosphere. So at room temperature, its vapor pressure is less than one atmosphere. In fact, uh, if you were to plot vapor pressure, vapor pressure versus temperature, you get something like this, okay? So when the temperature reaches 100 degrees, in the case of water, when this temperature reaches 100 degrees Celsius, your vapor pressure reaches one atmosphere. In fact, at room temperature, at around 25 degrees Celsius, your vapor pressure is about 23.8 torr. What's 23.8 torr? How, how many atmospheres is that? Do you remember how to calculate that? 23.8 divided by 760, that's 0 0.03 atmospheres, okay? That's about more or less what the vapor pressure of water is at room temperature. All right. Let's try this one. Ethyl alcohol boils at 78.4 degrees Celsius. Which of these two liquids has a higher vapor pressure at 78.4 degrees Celsius? Water or ethyl alcohol? <laughs> So if ethyl alcohol boils at 78.4, what's its vapor pressure at 78.4? One atmosphere. So if I were to plot vapor pressure versus temperature, for ethyl alcohol, it's going to reach one atmosphere. So here's one atmosphere. For ethyl alcohol, it's going to reach one atmosphere at 78.4 degrees, right? What point does the vapor pressure of water reach one atmosphere? Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So the water, va the vapor pressure of water reaches 100 degrees Celsius, uh, one atmosphere at 100 degrees Celsius. Correct? So which one has a higher vapor pressure? At 74, at 78, the, you know at 78.4, the vapor pressure of water is less than one atmosphere. But if alcohol is already boiling at that point, then the vapor pressure of alcohol is one atmosphere at that temperature. Okay, so we say that ethyl alcohol is more volatile, okay? It's a greater tendency to go into the gas phase. It has a higher vapor pressure, lower boiling point. So the expression more volatile is synonymous with having a higher vapor pressure or having a lower boiling point, okay? So what, how did we do on this one? Correct answer, got it right. Okay, so now let's talk about vapor pressure lowering. When you add a non-volatile solute, the vapor pressure above your solution is going to drop. In other words, okay, so here's my uh, liquid in equilibrium with the gas, okay? If I were to contaminate my liquid, I'm going to put some solutes in there that are not volatile. What happens is there's going to be Okay, at the instant I do that, I do that. There's going to be a momentarily, momentary increase in the rate, of, in the net 
transfer of gas molecules back to the liquid. So the vapor pressure of your gas is going to be lower. Okay, why would that happen? Well, think of it this way. Right. At equilibrium, let's imagine a surface here where you have, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Let's just, to make things simple, let's just imagine you had 10, consider 10 molecules of water there at the surface, okay? And you've got water molecules up here also, right? So, uh, at equilibrium, the rate at which the water leaves the li the mo water molecules leave the liquid would be equal to the rate at which the water molecules go back to the liquid from the gas. What happens if you contaminate your liquid with a non-volatile solid? So, what happens is, let's say, uh, two out of these ten molecules is not water anymore because you've contaminated it. Okay, remember, in a solution, uh, your solid is going to be spread out all over, right? So now 20% of your takeoff sites have been blocked. But the number of landing sites for molecules from the gas phase, from, okay, so if your molecules from the gas phase, the number of landing spots for them is the same, right? They can still land wherever they want, but uh, the takeoff sites for the water molecules to go from liquid to gas have been blocked. Only 80% of the takeoff sites remain. So what do you expect? Then you say the tendency for the liquid to go to the gas phase has been lowered. And so what the net result is when equilibrium is reestablished, the vapor pressure of your water is going to drop. The vapor pressure of your liquid is going to drop. Okay? So, in fact, what's going to be the vapor pressure? If P star is the vapor pressure before you contaminated it, so P star is the vapor pressure of the pure, in your case, okay, in the pure case, then, all right, so now, how, many, how much of it is blocked in this particular example? 20% is blocked, 2 out of 10, so... Only, you only now have 80% of the takeoff sites available for takeoff. So multiply this by the mole fraction of the water, okay? Which is in this particular example that I gave you is only 80% now, right? That would be the new vapor pressure of the water. Okay? So uh, going back up here, okay? So Raoult's law, okay, this observation uh, it's called Raoult's Law, says that the partial pressure or the vapor pressure of a volatile component of your mixture, so if you say A is a volatile component of your mixture, once it's contaminated, okay, its partial, its, its vapor pressure is going to be lowered, okay, so it's now going to be whatever the original vapor pressure is, so P star A, that's the vapor pressure if it was pure, multiplied by its mole fraction. Okay, so it, we call A is a, a, K, a our solvent in this case. So A would be water if your solvent is water. So what happens then? Well, by how much is the pressure lowered? Well, we, we take the original vapor pressure. That's the pure, the vapor pressure that would be in equilibrium with the pure liquid minus the vapor pressure that's in equilibrium with the solution. Okay, so P star A minus P sub A, that's your vapor pressure lowering. Okay. That's your vapor pressure lowering. So it's going to be equal to P star A minus the new pressure, which is P star A times XA. So what can I do with that? If I have P star A minus P star A times mole fraction of A, I can factor out P star A, right? So I factor out P star A, what, 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 what's left inside? It's going to be 1 minus X of A, okay? Distributive property, see? P star A times 1 is P star A. P star A times X A is P star A times X A. There? So what is 1 minus mole fraction of A? 
If you subtract the mole fraction of the solvent from one, what does that give you? That's the mole fraction of everything else. So I would call that XB, mole fraction of your solute. So in this case, we say X sub B is the mole fraction of your solute. Of your solute particles, okay? So your vapor pressure lowering, then we can say, is equal to P star A times the mole fraction. So delta P, which is P star A minus P A, is equal to the original vapor pressure of the solvent when it's pure times the mole fraction of the solutes, okay? What, what's a non-volatile solute? These are solutes that are ordinarily solids when they are in pure form, okay? So they, they have a very low tendency to turn, turn into a gas. So, quick clicker question right here. The vapor pressure of salt water at 100 degrees Celsius is A, less than one atmosphere, B, equal to one atmosphere, or C, higher than one atmosphere. What's the answer? See how we did? That's a mass here, very good. Vapor pressure lowering. Okay. At 100 degrees, if it was pure, the vapor pressure would be one atmosphere. So if it's if it's contaminated, it's not pure water anymore, the vapor pressure will be lower. Okay, here's another clicker question. Which of the following has a higher vapor pressure of water at the same temperature? A mixture of uh, 0.1 mole sodium chloride and 99.8 moles of water, or a mixture of 0.1 mole glucose plus 99.9 .9 moles of water. Ready? How we did. 50-50. Oh, Alright, so I, I guess you need your phone a friend lifeline. 50-50 uh, didn't work. Okay. So vapor pressure of water, let's call water A, is equal to P star A times mole fraction of water. Right? Now P star A is the same, right? In both cases, we're dealing with water. We're comparing water. So we just need to compare mole fraction of water. So what's the mole fraction of water? X sub A, in this case, is moles of A. So in, okay, so for choice A, what's the mole fraction of water? Moles of water over moles total, right? How many moles of water are in choice A? 99.8 moles. What's the total moles in choice A? 99.8 for water. But how many moles of solute particles do you have? Is it 0 0.1? 0 0.1 times 2. Why do you multiply this 0 0.1 by 2? What do you know about sodium chloride in water? What does it do in water? It ionizes, it actually gives you two particles, okay? So that's the idea behind colligative properties. You have to be looking at the total solute concent concentration of solute particles. So what's the mole fraction of water in this case? So 99.8 divided by, what's my denominator? What's 99.8 plus 0.2? 100, so my mole fraction of water here is 0 0.998. What about in the second case, in glucose? Mole fraction of water in choice B. Okay, mole fraction of water is 99.9, .9, okay, over the total. What's the total in this case? 99.9 .9 plus, how many moles of glucose do we have? 0.1. 
That's the Van Hoff factor for glucose. You multiply that by anything, multiply by one, right? Because it doesn't dissociate in water. So you add, you just add 0 0.1, 0 0.1 times one. So that's going to be 99.9 .9 over 100, which is 0 0.999. So in which case do you have a higher vapor pressure of water? Is it A or B? It's B. Okay. Higher mole fraction of water, higher vapor pressure of water. Which one will you get a larger vapor, uh, which, in which case will you get a larger vapor pressure lowering? Then it will be the opposite, okay? So here's a straightforward uh, question that just applies the formula. What is the vapor pressure of water in a solution at 85 degrees, okay? Containing 18 grams of glucose, 5.844 grams of sodium chloride dissolved in 500 grams of water. The vapor pressure of water is 433.6 millimeters of mercury. You might be wondering where did this come from? This is something you're gonna have to look up, okay? So uh, in cases like exams that where you don't have access to that kind of information that would be given to you. So partial pressure of water, I call that PW would be PW star, okay, times mole fraction of water. How do I get mole fraction of water here? Mole fraction of water is equal to moles of water over moles total. How many moles of water do I have? I have 500 grams of water. How do, I, how do I change that to moles? 500 grams over 18.02 grams per mole. Okay, that cancels grams. Okay, how do I get total moles? Well, part of that total would be the water, right? So 500.0 grams over 18.02 grams per mole plus so grams cancel out there what else do i have in my mixture glucose i have 18 grams of glucose c6h12o6 non-volatile solid so I have 18 grams. What's the molar mass of glucose? We've done this before. C6H12O6, 180.2 grams per mole. Okay. So now, plus how many moles of sodium chloride? How do you can calculate mole sodium chloride? grams divided by molar mass so 5.844 grams of sodium chloride divided by how many what's the molar mass of sodium chloride 58.44 grams per mole am i done other than punching this into a calculator not quite why what do we know about sodium chloride it gives you so, twice as many particles in solution, so I have to multiply this by two, okay? So that's your mole fraction of water. So all you have to do now is take all of these numbers, plug that into mole fraction of water, and what, what goes into here? That would be the partial pressure of pure water, okay? I guess you can do that on your own, huh? Let's talk about boiling point elevation now. This is the other, uh, one of the other colligative properties. Vapor pressure lowering would lead necessarily to boiling point elevation. Why is that? 
Well, boiling point, boiling happens when, when your uh, vapor pressure reaches one atmosphere. So if, if your vapor pressure has been lowered, then you need a higher temperature to reach a higher, uh, to reach one atmosphere. Okay, so a higher temperature would be needed to raise your vapor pressure to one atmosphere. So the formula for the boiling point elevation, delta Tb, is, this is the boiling point of the solution minus the boiling point of the pure liquid. The difference between those two is it directly proportional to the molality of solid particles in your solution. So the higher the molality of solid particles, the more non-volatile solids you have in your mixture, the higher the boiling point, the higher the temperature you need to get it to boil. Okay, so K sub B is your proportionality constant. It depends on what your solvent is. In the case of water, the value of K sub B for water is 0 0.512, 0 0.512 degrees per molality. Okay, this K sub B is also known as the ebullioscopic constant or the boiling point elevation constant. And again, keep in mind, that we're dealing here with the colligative properties. So whatever concentration number we plug in for solutes, it will have to be the concentration, total concentration of solute particles. All right. So uh, let's illustrate that with an example. Well, here's a clicker question. <laughs> Let's see if you got the idea, the concept, right? Uh, which boils at a higher temperature? 0.1 mole of sodium chloride in water is aqueous, or 0.1 mole of sucrose. C12H22O11 is sucrose. It's a molecular compound, right? So which one would have a higher boiling point? Okay, um, what's the molality? Uh, what's the boiling point? Delta Tb is the boiling point elevation, right? So the higher the delta Tb, the higher the boiling point, right? The more you elevate something, the higher it is. So it's equal to some constant times the molality. That means the bigger the molality, the bigger the, bigger the delta Tb, the higher the boiling point. Which one has a higher molality? What's the molality of solute particles in sodium chloride? Our molality here, the total molality here is 0 0.1 times 2, right? Why 2? Because your sodium chloride gives you sodium ions and chloride ions. It gives you two particles for every mole. Whereas C12H22O11, that's table sugar, that's sucrose, it's a molecular compound, it doesn't dissociate. So the molality, total molality there will still be 0.1. So you want a second chance? Let's redo the poll. Much better. That's, here's a straightforward calculation again. What's the boiling point of a solution containing 18 grams glucose and 5.844 grams NaCl dissolved in 500 grams of water? So what's the boiling point going to be? It's going to be the boiling point of the pure water plus delta Tb. What's the boiling point of pure water? Hundred degrees Celsius, right? So you just need to figure out the boiling point elevation. How do we calculate boiling point elevation? Delta T B equals K B times the total molality of solid particles. So what's our K B? Zero point five one two degrees Celsius per molality, right? 
what's our molality, what goes here. How do you calculate molality? What's the definition of molality? Molality is mole solute per kilogram of solvent. Okay. So how many moles of solute do we have? What's what's our solute here? Our solutes are glucose and sodium chloride. So let's calculate moles of glucose and sodium chloride. So it's going to be eight. How many grams of glucose did we have? Eighteen point zero. So eighteen point zero grams of glucose. What's the molar mass of glucose? 180.2 grams per mole. So that's moles of glucose. How many moles of sodium chloride do we have? 5.844 grams. Divided by molar mass of sodium chloride is 58.44 grams per mole. Is that all I need? What else do I have to do here? I have to multiply this by 2. Why? Again, your sodium chloride gives you 2. One mole of sodium chloride is going to give you twice as many moles, 2, mol, two, mol, two moles of particles, because sodium chloride will ionize into sodium ions and chloride ions, right? So that's the moles of solute. Okay, and what's a kilogram of solvent in this case? Okay, so this is a total moles of solute. How many kilograms of solvent do we have? We have 500 grams of water, right? So what's 500 grams? So 0 0.500 kilograms of water. So that will be your molality. And so whatever that number is, okay, that's what you plug into this thing right here. That's what you plug into there. Okay. And then you just add that to the original boiling point that gives you the boiling point of the mixture. Freezing the point depression. Okay. Uh, similar to boiling point elevation, except that this time it's depression. So, in other words, if I were to contaminate my water, what will happen to its freezing point? From zero degrees Celsius, it will now freeze at a lower temperature, right? So, the freezing point of the mixture minus the freezing point of the pure liquid, that's called your freezing point depression. It would be equal to negative Kf times N. So Kf here is a positive number. That's called your cryoscopic constant. Cryo has to do with freezing. Okay, like you've heard of cryogenics. Okay, so that's freezing point depression constant, case of F or cryoscopic constant. And M here again is the total molality of solid particles. Now, why is there a negative negative sign in front here? What do you expect T sub F? compared to T sub F star is? It's freezing point depression, right? So T sub F is going to be less than T sub F star. So the freezing point of your mixture is less than the freezing point of the pure liquid. So that's going to be a negative number. That's why you have that minus sign in front there on the formula. Okay, so let's see. It's a clicker question. On a winter day, sprinkling salt on an icy road will cause the ice to melt, B, cause any liquid water in contact with the ice to freeze. What happens when the freezing point is lowered? When you lower your freezing point, So melt, right? So sudden, 
suddenly now the temperature is no longer the temperature that you have is no longer the temperature where it freezes it will freeze at a lower temperature so that means it becomes a liquid at that temperature now so what's the freezing point depression freezing point of a solution containing 18 grams glucose and 5.844 grams sodium chloride dissolved in 500 grams water what would be the answer to this? The freezing point is equal to whatever the pure freezing, freezing point was, right? Plus delta TF. Why am I putting plus here when it's depressing? Because I know my delta TF is going to be a negative number. So when you add a negative, you get a lower uh, freezing point. Okay, so let's calculate delta TF. What, how would you calculate delta T F? It's minus K sub F times molality. And in the case of water, K sub F for water is 1.86 degrees per molality. Okay, that's the constant, the cryoscopic constant for water. And this molality, you just see the previous uh, slides, okay? See the previous question. It's the same problem we have. We have basically the same solution: 18 grams of glucose and 5.844 grams of sodium chloride. And again, don't forget that in the case of sodium chloride, you'd have to multiply the molality by two because you're going to get two particles. By the way, what if this wasn't sodium chloride? What if it was something like sodium sulfate? Instead of multiplying by two, you'd multiply by how much? by three because that was that's going to give you two sodium ions and the sulfate ions okay so keep in mind that you have to multiply by the van Hoff factor for ionic compounds okay so we've gone over vapor pressure lowering boiling point elevation freezing point depression the last of the four colligative properties is osmotic pressure what's osmotic pressure first of all let's define what osmosis is Osmosis refers to the passage of solvent molecules through a semi-permeable membrane. In other words, if you have, imagine you have two containers here, okay? You have pure A here, pure liquid A. Let's say A is water, okay? And here you have A plus others. Okay, so A is your solvent. And most of the time we're going to be dealing with water. Now, the boundary between these two compartments, okay, we're going to make that semi-permeable membrane. By semi-permeable, we mean it's like it allows some molecules to pass through, but others, but prevents others from passing through. So, we're going to say that this is permeable only to A, allows only A molecules to pass. Okay, so what's the what's observed when you have a situation like this? The tendency is for A to go from where its concentration is higher to where its concentration is lower. That's always a general tendency you'll find in nature. Things go from where it's concentrated to where it's less concentrated. So there's a tendency for A molecules in, or in water molecules if you're dealing with an aqueous solution to go from the pure side to the to the contaminated side, okay? So that movement of water molecules through a semi-permeable semi -permeable membrane is called osmosis, okay? So what's osmotic pressure? So here, yeah, the natural tendency is from move, movement from high solvent concentration to low solvent concentration. What's osmotic pressure? That is the additional pressure that you have to exert on this side Okay, so in other words, if I were to exert an extra pressure here, I can actually prevent osmosis. I can prevent water molecules from going to the left side here by exerting additional pressure on the solution. So that's called the osmotic pressure of the solution. So that's the additional pressure that you have to exert on the solution 
to prevent the flow of to prevent osmosis to prevent the flow of pure uh, of, of your solvent from the pure side okay now uh the, that's just the minimum pressure you need because once you've exceeded that pressure what happens is osmosis will actually reverse it will flow the other way you have what's called reverse osmosis so there's a minimum pressure you have to exert on that there's a pressure you need to exert on that just to prevent the flow from either side okay so that's called your osmotic pressure we represent that by the capital greek letter pi okay and that turns out to be directly proportional to proportional to the molarity of solid particles in your solution so it's mrt R is the gas constant, okay, and T is the temperature in Kelvin, okay? And like I said, if you exert higher pressure than that, then you have reverse osmosis. Practical application of that is in the purification of water. So if you've uh, looked at all of these uh, devices that they use to purify water, you might count, if you look, read up on that topic, you'll encounter the topic of reverse osmosis, okay? So, Let's see, here's a clicker question. Suppose the left compartment in the figure shown below contains pure water and the right compartment uh, contains salt water. So the la one on the left is pure water and the right comp compartment is salt water. Assuming the barrier allows only water molecules to pass, what's the direct net direction of water flow? Left to right or right to left? Is your clicker on? So let's see. Left to right, very good. From where this, your solvent concentration is higher to where your solvent concentration is lower, that's the direction of osmosis. Okay. Osmotic pressure of seawater is equivalent to that of an aqueous solution containing 27 grams of sodium chloride per liter. What pressure can be used to desalinate seawater by reverse osmosis at room temperature? Okay. Well, what, you need the pressure equal to the osmotic pressure. What would that be? It's equal to M bar T. Okay. So what's our molarity? It has 27 grams sodium chloride per liter. So, how about the formula for molar molarity? Mole solute per liter of solution, right? So, how do we get mole solute? How many grams sodium chloride do we have? 27 grams. How do you change that to moles? Molar mass of sodium chloride is 58.44 grams per mole. Okay. That changes it to moles. And what's the volume of our solution? One liter, right? 27 grams per liter. So what's our molarity? And before I forget, what do I need to multiply this with? Multiply by two. Because you need the total molarity of solid particles. So what, what is that number? Okay. 27 times 2 divided by 58.44. It's 9.24, so 0 0.924, okay, moles per liter. Now, how many sig figs do I have here based on the given? I should only have two sig figs, right? So it's 0 0.92, I'm just keeping that extra digit there, since this is an intermediate step in the calculation. So our osmotic pressure is molarity 
which is 0.924 moles per liter. What is R and what is T? Temperature is 298 Kelvin, room temperature. Okay. And so 298 Kelvin. What's the value for R? You remember that from ideal gas law? R is 0 0.08206 liters times atmosphere per mole per Kelvin. That's the value of R. So liter cancels out, mole cancels out, Kelvin cancels out. So you have your pressure, your osmotic pressure in atmosphere. And what would that be? So I have 0.924 times 0 0.08206 times 298. It's going to be 22.6. With two sig phase, it's going to be 23 atmospheres. Okay? So. should be about, oh, I gave the wrong choices, huh? Should be point, let me see if I made a mistake in my calculation here. 27 divided by 58.44 times 2, okay, it's point nine two four times 0 0.08206 times 298, it's 22.6, so about 23, okay, 23 atmospheres. <coughs> All right, how about this one? An intravenous solution is 5% uh, weight by volume glucose, calculate its osmotic pressure. This would be an example of what we would call an isotonic solution, okay? And so, what's the percent by volume of an isotonic saline solution? That means it will have, if an isotonic saline solution will have the same osmotic pressure as the glucose solution. Okay, so, in other words, the first thing we need to do is calculate the osmotic pressure of this. So, what would that be? MRT, right? And what is our M? How much glucose do we have? 5% weight by volume. So 5 grams of glucose. 5.00. 5.00 grams. How do I change that to moles? Divide by 180.2 grams per mole. And multiply by two, by three, or what? Just one, because I just have one. Your, your glucose doesn't dissociate. Okay, divided by, that's five grams in 100 mils, right? 5%, this means 5.00 grams in 100 mils. That's what percent. That was, that's what percent weight by volume means. So that what would I have to do here? What's my volume in liters? 0 0.1 liter. Okay. Now that 0 0.1 liter there is exact. Okay. My sig fig here has is in the 5.00. That's two sig figs. So what's my R? 0 0.08206 times 0.08206 liter times atmosphere per mole per Kelvin. And what's my temperature? 298 Kelvin. Okay. So what would that be? Well, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna call this RT, okay? I'm just gonna leave it at RT because I really I'm only interested in having the same molarity, right? Same molarity, 
will have the same osmotic pressure. So I don't even really need to calculate the RT there. So what's 5 divided by 180.2 divided by 0.1? 5 divided by 180.2 divided by 0.1 is 0.277 moles per liter. So an isotonic solution then would be one that has a molar concentration of 0.277 moles per liter, about 0.3 moles per liter. Okay, so what would be the molarity of the sodium chloride solution? It's also going to be 0.277, right? But that's the total molarity. So your sodium chloride then the, the solution of sodium chloride you're going to need is 0.277 over 2 moles per liter. Why divide by 2? Because your sodium chloride is going to give you twice as many particles, right? So the molarity of sodium chloride solution would be 0.277 divided by 2. And that's going to be 0.1385. moles per liter and what's the, how how much how many grams would that how would you change that to so that's the molarity of your sodium chloride how would you change that to percent weight by volume you can just say 0.1385 moles of sodium chloride how do you change that to grams Fifty-eight point four four grams per mole sodium chloride. Okay. Divide that by how many mils? A thousand mils. Okay. Times a hundred percent. Okay. Or you can just say times. 100 mils per deciliter because uh, percent weight by volume is really grams per deciliter. Okay, so if it's just a convenient way of doing it, so what would that be? 0.1385 times 58.44 divided by a thousand times 100. That's 0.809%. Okay. Weight by one. So 0.8% will have the same uh, uh, osmotic pressure. Okay, so those are your four colligative properties. Try this one. A hypertonic solution is more concentrated and it's a higher osmotic pressure. Okay. Uh, if 0.3 molar glucose is isotonic, remember we calculated it's 0.277, which of these is hypertonic? 0.3 molar NaCl or 0.1 molar calcium chloride? Or 0.1 molar calcium chloride? Or let me add two choices here. Both be none. None of these. Ready? So what's the answer? Okay, it looks like I just tricked you. Um, what's point three? What's the total molarity for point three? I have to multiply that by two, right? So that's higher than point three molar glucose. So that's hypertonic. Okay, 
And what about choice B? 0 0.1 times, what do I multiply that to get the total molarity? Calcium chloride is going to give you one calcium and two chlorine ions. So I have to multiply 0 0.1 by 3. That gives me 0.3. So that's, high, that's isotonic. Okay. So the answer here is, looks like I misled you, huh? A is hypertonic, okay? Okay, so here's an application of colligative properties, determination of molar masses. The basic idea here is uh, you prepare a mixture. So if you do, you make the mixture yourself, you go to the lab, you know how much solute you're using, how much solvent you're using. So you know the mass of the solute and the solvent. Then you measure a colligative property. Okay, so in your Chem 110 lab, you're going to either be measuring the boiling point elevation or the freezing point depression. So if, what if you know the colligative property and you made the mixture? So uh, from the colligative property, what can you determine? Remember, for example, let's say you did delta TF. That's going to be equal to minus KF times M, right? So you can go to the lab, you can measure the freezing point of pure, pure water, and then measure the freezing point of the solution that you made. You can get your delta Tf. You know the Kf for water. So you can get the total concentration of solid particles. So you'll be able to solve for the total molality. So once you've done that, you should be able to calculate the total moles of solid particles because you know how much solvent you have, right? You might, what's the definition of molality? Mole solute over kilograms of solvent, right? So if you multiply kilograms of solvent by the total molality, that gives you the total moles of solute. So your molar mass is whatever the mass of your solute was divided by the total moles of solute particles, okay? Grams per mole, that's your molar mass. That would be your average molar mass. Okay, and that's going to be exactly the molar mass of your, that's going to be the molar mass of your solute if your solute doesn't fall apart, doesn't dissociate. Okay, if your Van Hoff factor is one, then that would be your molar mass. If your solute splits into two, then you have to, what? You're going to get twice as many particles, so you have twice as many moles, you end up with a molar mass that's lower. Okay? So that's the average, the, the average of the molar mass of the ions that you're getting if it's uh, if your solute dissociates. So let's uh, summarize that procedure. So you measure your colligative property, delta Tf or delta Tb in the lab. You get your total molality. The osmolality is the total molality. How do you get from there? Delta Tf is equal to Kf times M, negative Kf times M, right? So your osmolality would just be delta Tf over negative Kf. Same thing with the boiling point. You divide by Kb instead. Now, gram solvent, how do you change grams to kilograms? One kilogram is 1,000 grams. So kilograms times osmolality will give you moles of solid. And you measure the grams of solute to begin with. So these are things that you measure in the lab. And then these are, this is what you calculate from your result. So gram solute divided by moles of solute will give you the molar mass. Let's see if we have an example for that. Okay. A two gram sample of an unknown solid is mixed with 20 grams of benzene. Okay. Pure benzene freezes at 5.533 degrees Celsius. So Tf star, pure benzene melts at or freezes at 5.533 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now, when the benzene was contaminated, when 20 grams of benzene was mixed with 2 grams of your unknown solid, you found that the freezing point is now negative 0.87 degrees Celsius. And... The Kf, the cryoscopic constant for benzene, is 5.12 degrees Celsius per molality. Okay? So this is what you did in the lab. You took out 20 mils of benzene, uh, 20 grams of benzene, 
okay? Benzene is C6H6. And then to that, you added two grams of unknown. Okay? And so you measured the freezing point of that mixture. And you found that to be negative 0.87 degrees Celsius. And you measured the freezing point of pure benzene, you find that to be 5.533 degrees Celsius. You look up the KF for benzene, go look it up from a handbook. Uh, it's 5.12 degrees per molality. So what would be your molar mass for the unknown? How would we solve for this? Let's go back to our strategy back here, our diagram. From the colligative property, what do we do? We can calculate the osmolality, the total molality of solid particles. So let's do that first. What's our osmolality? It's delta TF over negative delta TF over KF. What's our delta TF? What's the freezing point of our mixture? Negative 0.87 degrees Celsius. What's the freezing point of our pure liquid? 5.533 degrees Celsius. Okay. What's our KF for benzene? 5.12. Okay. Don't use 1.86 here. Use when do you use 1.86? when you're using water, right? This is benzene. So if you're not using water as your solvent, you have to look up your KF. So in the case of benzene, it's 5.12 degrees Celsius per molality. Okay? By the way, uh, you might see this written as degrees Celsius per mole times kilogram because molality is moles per kilogram, okay? So you... you if when you look these numbers up, this might be shown as moles per kilogram. So you might see it degrees Celsius per mole per kilogram. Or the unit might be given to you as degrees Celsius per mole times kilograms. Because your kilograms per kilogram is in your denominator. So I just want you to be aware of that. It, might, it will not always be shown as just little m. Because M is just, little M is just abbreviation for moles per kilogram, okay? And since you're do dealing with temperature changes here, okay, this degree Celsius, if you look it up, it might be shown as Kelvin instead of degree Celsius, okay? A one degree change on the Celsius scale is equivalent to a one Kelvin change. So keep that in mind. Don't, don't be thrown off if you do see uh, different units shown there. A Kelvin unit... As far as temperature differences are concerned, a temperature change of one Kelvin is the same as a temperature change of one degree Celsius. You don't add 273 or subtract 273, okay? Because we're looking at differences in temperature. Uh, just to elaborate, zero degree Celsius is 273, right? One degree Celsius is how many Kelvin? 274 Kelvin, right? So a one degree change, if delta T is one degree Celsius, that's also one Kelvin. Okay. All right, so let's we do, go ahead and finish this up. Let's see, what do we have here? What's, what's our delta T at? Negative 0.87. So what do I have here? Negative, oops. Okay. Negative. 0.87 negative minus 5.533 that's negative 6.403 okay. so negative of negative 6.403 how many sig figs should I have here this is addition and subtraction so I have to stop at this second decimal place so this is my last sig fig here divided by 5.12 degrees Celsius per molality. That gives me negative, negative, that's positive, so 6.403 degrees Celsius over 5.12 degrees Celsius per molality. Degrees Celsius cancels out. What would that be? 
6.403 divided by 5.12, that gives you 1.25. So our molality is 1.25 moles per kilogram. That's our total molality, our, our osmolality. Are we done? It's not what we're looking for, is it? You need the molar mass, right? So let's see, what do we have so far? Our molality is 1.25 moles of solute particles per kilogram, okay? How do we actually get the total moles? What's the definition of molality? Mole solute per kilogram of solvent, right? So mole, molality times kilograms of solvent will give you moles of solvent. Okay, so let's see, go back here. Molality times kilograms of solvent will give you moles of solvent. So what's, how many moles of solvent do I have? Let's see. Uh, I'll say moles of solid. Solid particles is molality. times kilograms of solvent. And that gives us, what's our molality? 1.25 mole per kilogram. How many kilograms of solvent do we have? It's 20 grams of benzene, so it's 20 grams. That's 0 0.02000 kilograms, right? That's four sig figs right there. So how much is that? 1.25 times 0 0.02, that's 0 0.025 moles. They say big, so 0 0.0250 moles. Now that we know how many moles we have, what's our molar mass? This is solute, okay? Moles of solute. And so our molar mass is grams per mole. So grams, solute over moles of solute. Okay, so that's equal to, how many grams of solute do we have in the problem? Two grams, you're given two grams of solute, two grams of your unknown. 2.00 grams divided by the moles of solute is 0 0.025. So that gives us 2 divided by 0 0.025, 80 grams per mole. 80.0 grams per mole. Okay? So that's how you determine the molar mass from a polygonic property. And so there's more problems for you to work on. I think I'll let you work that out yourself. So this might be a good time to take a break.